Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. How does one experience heaven right here, right now? Many of us can feel the excitement when we feel the experience of heaven when things are going well. You seem to get that job or you get the pay raise, perhaps the relationship you're looking for, maybe even that dream home or the vacation that you're looking for. Most of us will generally celebrate the feeling of being in heaven when we feel things are good. But what if things aren't going so well? How do we describe or feel that experience in the kingdom of heaven? Our guest today is joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. He's going to be sharing an understanding that the kingdom of heaven is within each and every one of us as Christ Jesus taught each and every one of us. Our guests also realize that the peace and joy inherent in the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual universe, are available to her at all times and under all circumstances. It is this understanding that has carried her through difficult professional situations such as traveling with safety throughout the world. She's also earned her bachelor's degree in physics. She's also got an MBA from UCLA and was employed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory for more than 35 years. During her time at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, she participated in and managed the development of technology and scientific instrumentation for Earth, planetary, and astrophysics missions, earning NASA's Exceptional Service Medal for her work on an experiment which flew on early space shuttle missions. We're going to be talking about today how we can experience heaven now. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Mary Bothwell. Mary, thank you for being on the program today. Well, Daniel, thank you very much for inviting me. You bet. Now, the title of the talk, Experiencing Heaven Now, suggests that people can feel that they're in heaven wherever they are. How are you defining this word, heaven? Ah, well, I think we have to start this whole conversation with that. And um, I have a definition that means a lot to me. Um, And it might be, we might need to go into it in a little more detail, but uh, it's a phrase that actually I made up based on my spiritual study and practice. Uh, To me, heaven is that sense of peace that indicates God's presence now. And while um, I say that it indicates God's presence, I don't think somebody actually has to believe in God to feel this sense of peace. Um, it might be helpful because you'd know who or what to credit, but I think everybody can feel that this sense of peace that is a result of God acting in their lives. Now, a lot of times people might think that there is a difference between heaven and spirituality, but they could be related. Tell us how that is. Well, um, to me, they're almost the same. Um, I think maybe I need to start by defining what spirituality is so we can sort of work through to what the, how, how they're related. To me, um, spirituality is a sense of connectedness to a higher power for good. Uh, there are a lot of people out there these days that, that believe that, there's, that spirituality has a really strong presence in their lives. Again, whether or not they believe in in God, but often they do believe that it's connected to something higher than themselves, something perhaps outside of themselves, but that has a good influ- influence on their selves. Um, so, so you have this sense of connectedness with a higher power, that's spirituality. We have the kingdom of heaven, which is a sense of peace that indicates God's presence now. To me, then, it makes logical sense that if the kingdom of heaven is where God reigns. I mean, after all, if you have a kingdom, something is in charge. For me, it's it's the idea of, of an omnipresent God. And if you have spirituality where you have a connection with that God, then we have a really close synergy, at least, between the kingdom of heaven and spirituality. In, in my study of the Bible, where the word spirituality isn't used very often at all, except um, maybe a couple times in the New Testament, I, I find that spirit that mostly it's it, in the New Testament it's heaven and the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. But I find that the characteristics of both are about the same. So I I don't get too hung up on whether I'm thinking that I'm spiritual or whether I'm thinking I'm in the kingdom of heaven, both are true. 
I don't know. Um, at any rate, that's sort of where I go with that. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, what would you? How would you? I guess, in your best words, um, I guess, uh, understand or how would you describe God? Well, for starters, I I think of three words that sort of describe the entire nature of God. God is omnipresent. That means he's in all places at all times, which means he's accessible to everybody. Um, God is omniscient, all-knowing. And God is all-loving. And I think this is one of the most important things to me, to realize that God, at least my concept of God, is that he's a very loving God, very concerned about every individual, whether or not we're living in obedience to the laws of God at the moment or not. But the, but the idea of God is much bigger than that even. Um, the Bible talks about a lot of different characteristics of God. Uh, for instance, in, in Psalms, in the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, we read about God's wisdom and his strength. To me, these are characteristics of God that all of us can, can realize. Because when we are being wise, we are reflecting the wisdom of God. God, um, I love the idea of thinking of God as divine mind. Um, the Apostle Paul told us that we should have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. So God is divine mind means that intelligence, creativity, wisdom I've used before, that all of these characteristics of God are available to us all the time. God is divine soul tells me that, um, and the, the Psalms use the word soul a lot, uh, but God is divine soul reminds me that God is, that all of the beauty and the harmony that we experience here on earth is part of the kingdom of heaven where God is reigning. And, you know, I'm just looking at it in my backyard at the moment, and it's beautiful. Um, we have kind of a wild backyard, but it's, it's beautiful and it's green, and, and to me that's an indication of God's presence, of God expressing himself in a way that I can understand Um, There are lots of other characteristics of God. I mentioned love, and we see that through things like kindness, tenderness, care. Just um, caring for every individual is our expression of God's love for that other individual. Uh, Principle is expressed in things like orderliness and obedience, more, more characteristics of God, but that we can see that help our lives be better. Now, I could probably talk for 15 or 20 minutes on this, so if you'd like me to go on, I will. For some people, actually, you need that long just so they get a feeling, you know, this actually seems like it's on the level. You know, we live in a day and an age, for instance, where organized religion has really become tainted. You know, people tend to want to uh, discover their spirituality outside of an organized religion, uh, even in a belief in God, if you will. Uh, Would you say that these people could still experience heaven? Well, yeah, exactly. They can. Um, I just can't imagine if if you can start with the premise that God is good, which I, I believe. I can't imagine a, a good God, a good higher power, picking and choosing who he's going to be kind to and who he's not going to be kind to. I, I don't believe that God is a capricious God. I don't believe that he has predestinated some of us for the good life and others of us for <clears throat> purgatory or eternal hell. God is good, and that goodness is available to all of us. Now, it doesn't mean that we aren't going to have challenges. And it doesn't mean that sometimes we'll feel like we're separated from God. But I think every one of us has that innate sense of spirituality, that we're all born with it. Then we can discover it if we need to. Dis- you know, if we aren't feeling connected, we can discover it and reconnect with God or whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call the higher power. And this is available to anybody. 
whether you believe in the Judeo-Christian God, whether you believe in another form of a higher power, whether you don't believe at all, that sense of peace of the kingdom of heaven is there for everybody. Now, how would you best describe that kingdom of heaven, you know, for listeners that may have thought they may have experienced it or perhaps haven't? You know, what is that experience like? Well, um, let me share an example that I had. This hap- actually happened when I was in college. And it's one of the, it was kind of a defining moment in my life because all of a sudden, through this example, I realized that I could actually experience the kingdom of heaven within me, within, in my immediate experience. Um, and it also kind of, at least for me, illustrates this connection between spirituality and the kingdom of heaven. I was in college, and, you know, college students sometimes get into funks for no particular reason at all, and I found myself feeling extremely disconnected and apart from from all of my friends. I basically felt friendless, and and this is not a good experience to feel. Um, And I struggled with it for a while. I also struggled with how do I pray about this. But what what got me started was I read a statement in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, boy, I'll tell you, at that point, I didn't think the kingdom of heaven was anywhere near me. You know, out beyond Pluto someplace was about as close as it could have been, as I, as I thought. And yet, I had had enough experiences to know that there are certain truths in the Bible that are true for everybody and that I had been able to experience in my own life. So I started thinking about this and thinking, okay, so the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean to me right now in this sort of disconnected state that I'm in? And I realized that I could acknowledge that all of the characteristics of God were available to me right then and there. I have to admit it was hard because I was feeling lonely, but I started with really simple things. I remember sitting in the dining room one night thinking, oh, I don't have anything to be grateful for. It was around, um, around Thanksgiving time. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. There's food on the table in front of me. Now, this may seem really simple, but it was something I could grab hold of and know that, okay, I can see God taking care of me right here because I do have food to eat. And that, you know, then I got on to being grateful for other things. Well, the story kind of culminates in a job that I had during Christmas break where I continued to pray, trying to realize these characteristics of God being evidenced in my life. And all of a sudden one day, I just felt completely enveloped in God's love. It was like the kingdom of heaven had moved from Pluto to right where I was standing. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel friendless or disconnected any, anymore. Nothing had changed physically. Nothing, nobody, I didn't have a friend walk in or anything like that. But all of a sudden, I just felt completely embraced by God's love. And that was kind of like a, one of those wow moments um, that I can feel it right here and right now. Now, since then, It doesn't mean that I haven't felt sometimes like things weren't as harmonious as they should be. I mean, I've had some some experiences that were not harmonious. But what that experience taught me was that I can feel the kingdom of heaven right now if I really recognize it and really acknowledge God's presence. And doing that helps me resolve whatever the inharmonious situation is. You know, it's very unique that people, when they're facing what seems to be tremendous adversity in their lives, would take a look and question, for instance, God, why are you punishing me? What would you say to people that have that sort of thinking? I think that's the kind of thinking that a lot of people have, that they feel that 
that there is this capricious God who decides whether or not he's going to punish or reward people based upon their actions. Uh, to me, that punishment is more like like hell. I mean, it tr- actually, when you're in that kind of a situation, you feel like you're in hell. But um, I don't. I I personally don't believe that God punishes any of us. I think it's our misunderstanding of God or our misunderstanding of the fact that God's goodness is available. Um, I don't think that God, as I've said it a couple times, that God is capricious. He doesn't decide who he's going to punish. But it doesn't mean that we might not have some difficult times. Um, the, the promise is that God is there. The Apostle Paul said in, in Romans, neither height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so even when you feel like you're being punished, it's getting back to that understanding that God is there and seeing even one little tiny piece of of God's presence, whether it's the sun is shining so I can feel warmth. You know, it it gets that simple. Um, And I believe people can work themselves out of it based upon that, based upon hanging on to what these characteristics of God are that are always present and always acting in our lives, whether or not we're actually realizing it at the moment or not. From your perspective, what would you consider the role of God in one's spiritual experience? From my perspective, I think it's immense. Um, I I think that God is, I, I believe I was created by God, that God created me in his image and likeness, as it says in the first chapter of Genesis, that um, every good thing that happens in my life is a result of God's action in my life. I um, get a lot of a lot of um, actually instruction from from Christ Jesus and what he has said about God and the influence of of God in in Jesus's life. Uh, to me, it's it's kind of the he's the high power. He's the supreme power, the one that is guiding my life in every aspect. But you could then say, okay, so what if something bad happens? Um, to me, that's a misstep. It's where I'm tripping up and not recognizing the goodness of God in my life, and I need to get back to, to God's goodness, to what he, what he created as the perfect image of himself, which would be my expression of God. Or another way to put it is he is expressing himself through me. And I should say, I just due to culture and um, and education, I, I slip into calling God him. Um, that's the way I was taught in English, um, in, in English classes. I think God is bigger than being an individual. I don't want to anthropomorphize God. It's more of a, a universal presence that's both male and female that exists, that um, created every aspect of his creation in a way that we can recognize um, from whatever perspective we're coming from, from whether, whether we're coming from a perspective that believes strongly in a, in a God that's a him, her, or whether we're, we believe strongly in just a higher power that is tenderly caring for the entire creation. Now, it's interesting because you worked with NASA that you have a scientific perspective. How would you say that relationship in science uh, may have kind of, I guess, changed your perspective a little bit to kind of maybe scratch your head and question, you know, does God really exist? After all, we don't tend to sense any real physical evidence, or it's maybe difficult to describe what God is, but... It's interesting when you see, I remember years ago as I was 
pursuing religious studies on my own just out of curiosity was that you'd find scientists would eventually become priests and priests would eventually become scientists or astronomers. And it seems like they were both in pursuit of the same things, in pursuit of the truth, you know. And and realizing that, it's really a fascinating perspective when you take a look at bringing science into the mix and thinking, does that actually encourage or strengthen your belief in in that particular way? Or, you know, how does that take you, for instance? Well, I actually love thinking about the two together, and yet, in some ways, it's it's like oil and water. But one of the things that um, I particularly, I, I guess it's probably due to my experience in working with scientists who are trying to, um, you know, astronomers and astrogeologists and things like that, who are trying to discover the whether or not there's life on other planets or in other solar systems. One of the things that that my religious and my spiritual background has brought to me is the idea that there actually could be uh, life and that I can actually accept the fact that there's life in whatever form it is in other places, that we are not alone in this universe. And... I love the idea of thinking about, okay, just some other sun someplace with planets going around it. And, you know, they've discovered hundreds of these since, since my career in aerospace began. Um, and I think about the people or whatever the, the intelligent life is that is on these other planets, realizing that they, too, are governed by God under the under the control of God, and that they can never be outside of God's love and care either. It's kind of thinking that's out there. I know some people might have a little trouble with that, but I just can't see that anything in the, uni- in the physical universe can be outside of the care of this loving God. Um, and I, I just love thinking about it. The, the other aspect to this for me is, Thinking about the, I mean, I worked with some of the brightest uh, astronomers and astrophysicists, astrogeologists, and things like that on on the planet. And thinking about the incredible creativity that is expressed by all of these researchers, thinking about their openness to new ideas, that all of this is really based in an understanding that, that they were all created by God, that God is informing them. And it doesn't matter whether they believe it or not. All of this immense creativity, the, the, the openness to new ideas, the idea that, wow, there could be life on Mars. I mean, a long time ago, nobody thought there could be. I mean, it's gone. It, it's just wonderful. And I get, I get pretty excited about it. You know, it's pretty exciting, too, as you were alluding to earlier, how science and spirituality uh, really go together. And I completely agree with you on that. You know, people would kind of think, no, they seem different. I said, well, really think about this. In science, you're trying to pursue a truth, a very consistent one. You know, how can we create fire, for instance? You've got the fire triangle. You know, you remove any one of those elements or you increase one more than the others and you don't have fire. It's just that simple. It's a provable scientific fact. Now, what's interesting about that is, now let's go with someone who, for instance, has a dream or an idea they would like to pursue. In your case, let's say you wanted to invent a rocket that went into space. Now, first of all, the idea has to have enough faith for you to carry out the actions to get that rocket launched off the surface of the planet in the first place and to get to the destination you want to go. And, of course, you're going to face a lot of adversity because this is a brand-new idea, a brand-new concept that you're trying to bring into life, breathe life into, and and bring to fruition. Eventually, that faith gets tested to a point that you go over that point and you realize, I can do this. And I think that really goes hand-in-hand with the way people live their lives, that if they co-intermingle these two things, you have religious faith. I have faith that today is going to bring me more, perhaps, or something better than I had yesterday. I just have to have faith that's going to happen. 
And science steps in and says, well, you know, because you believe that way, you know, your intention, you're right. <laughs> and you can see how these two things actually work well together, don't you? Well, absolutely. And, you know, the the physical laws that cause that rocket ship to blast off from the Earth and go into orbit around the Earth or the Sun or wherever you're blasting it off to, those physical laws are universal. They would work on Earth, on Mars, on some planet uh, around some other sun. They would have worked billions of years ago before there were any people on Earth. Um, those physical laws are, well, as I said, they were, they're universal. And I think that's the same with the laws of God, that God's laws are universal and applicable to everybody. And um, so, so, you know, I think about, for instance, um, the, the whole idea that the earth is flat. Well, it's not. We all know that it's not. But, well, some people still believe it is. But even when people truly believed that the earth was flat, that didn't make the earth flat. The earth was still a sphere. And I, I see that in applying the laws of God to our own lives. These are universal laws that actually, when applied correctly, result in healing um, because they're universal. And it doesn't matter that some people believe they work and some people don't or that, you know, they, they seem to have operated at different periods throughout history. They are universal and they do work just like the physical laws getting that rocket ship off the, off the surface of the Earth. Absolutely. It's pretty exciting stuff. Now, if somebody wanted to learn more about the Kingdom of Heaven, where would you advise them to start? Uh, I would start with the Bible, because there's a lot in the Bible about it. Um, I'd like to give maybe one example, and then we'll go on to number two. But, okay, so I'd start in the Bible, actually in the New Testament, because Jesus preached, in many cases, uh, what the kingdom of heaven was like. And he told parables. These are um, stories that told in very accessible terms what the kingdom of heaven is like. And many of these parables start, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he tells a little story um, in very human terms. Uh, one example is he's talking about a woman who's baking bread. And he says the kingdom of heaven is, is like leaven, which we'd call yeast today, is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, which we'd call flour, uh, until it was all leavened. Well, if you think about, uh, it's very simple, you know, yeast plus flour, water, and salt makes bread. But what's the role of the yeast, which he's, equivalent, e he's equating to the kingdom of heaven? The yeast first permeates the flour and water mixture. It, it causes the flour and water mixture to change chemically, which not only makes it rise, but it also improves the flavor. And I think what Jesus is teaching us in this parable is that the kingdom of heaven permeates and transforms our lives for the better. I mean, you know, flour and water mixed together don't taste very good. But flour, water, ye and yeast mixed together and treasured and worked in the right way becomes a delicious loaf of bread. And, uh, you know, that's, so that's what I'm, I, I take from this parable, that Jesus is saying, treasure it, know that it's working in you, and then you, your life will be transformed just as the yeast transforms the flour and water. And you can't go backwards. You can't decompose the loaf of bread back into flour, water, and yeast. It's something new, something better. And, you know, it takes a little, um, actually, I think communing with God, a little bit of quiet listening to look to the spiritual message in Jesus' parables. But I think that um, with a little bit of insight, people will get what they need out of them. Um, there, there are probably two dozen parables. I haven't counted them recently, but there are quite a few 
where Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like. The other place I'd look is in um, Mary Baker Eddy's book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which is a book that Christian scientists use as a companion to the Bible. The Christian scientists look at the Bible as the inspired word of God. And then science and health is something that helps to describe in terms that we understand today how Jesus Jesus did his works and his healing works. So, and Mary Baker Eddy makes some interesting statements about the kingdom of heaven, which take you right back to the Bible. One of them that I that I particularly like, although she's really talking um, in very flowery 19th century English. Um, She says, the thunder of Sinai and the Sermon on the Mount are pursuing and will overtake the ages, rebuking in their course all error and proclaiming the kingdom of heaven on earth. Well, the thunder of Sinai is the Ten Commandments. And the Sermon on the Mount is the core of Jesus' teaching. It's in Matthew uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. It includes the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and things like love your enemies. Um, but, but to me, this is saying, go back to the Ten Commandments. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Live them. And they are proclaiming the kingdom of heaven right here. As you live the teachings of these two um, important works, spiritual works in the Bible, you yourself will start to experience the kingdom of heaven right here and right now. Fascinating talk, Mary. I want to thank you, first of all, for being on the program today. And I'm wondering, is there a website people can find out more? Absolutely. Um, They can go to pdxcslectureseries.com to find out more about the two more lectures that are in the, these are talks, um, lecture is kind of a formal word, that are in this series being sponsored by Area Portland Churches. They can go to uh, christianscience.com to learn more about Christian science. And I have a website, maryboswell.com. So any of those three websites should help people. Lots of places people can go to discover the kingdom of heaven right here and right now, just like this conversation. (laughs) Mary, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you, Daniel. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us today. You can also discover more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past halfway.